enveloped in the darkness of the whale's belly, the darkness of the deep ocean surrounded by the darkness of night, Prophet Yunus salam, found himself amidst the trial of three layers of darkness. In the story of Prophet Yunus salam, we're reminded of Allah's infinite mercy, reaching his servants in the deepest and darkest of places. Like the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Prophet Yunus alayhi salam was rejected by his people during the early days of spreading his message. He was sent to warn them of their wrongdoings, but his people rejected his message and refused to turn away from their actions. In his anger, Prophet Yunus alayhi salam walked away from his people without permission from Allah. And at that moment, Allah caused a storm to arise, but just as the clouds started to gather, we see a change in events. The people of Prophet Yunus salam, are alarmed by the storm and begin repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking for forgiveness. Meanwhile, Allah caused the storm to arise in the sea where Prophet Yunus was on a ship. And after a game of draws, the Prophet Yunus is thrown overboard. And by Allah's command, a giant whale swallows the Prophet Yunus, alayhi salam. Three days and three nights in three layers of darkness, there inside the dark and acidic belly of the whale, Prophet Yunus lay. Sometimes we too find ourselves in the deepest and darkest of places. Sometimes we see that as being inescapable. But we're reminded by Prophet Yunus' story that even in those dark places, there is refuge. There is hope. Allah is the all-seeing, the all-hearing, and the all-knowing. So in the belly of the whale, Prophet Yunus calls out, فَنَادَى فِي الظُّلُمَاتِ أَن لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنْتَ سُبْحَانَكْ إِنِّي كُنْتُ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ There is no God but you. Glory be to you. Truly, I have been one of the wrongdoers. Acknowledging his wrongdoing, his imperfection, his humanness. There he prayed to Allah for forgiveness and was eventually released from the whale's belly, returning to his people only to find them having repented and accepted the message of Allah's mercy. We are reminded over and over again to never give up hope, to trust in Allah's plan, to strive to recognize our shortcomings and to hasten our repentance in asking for forgiveness. Please continue to join us for Maristan's Embracing Resilience series, where we'll delve into stories and of the tribulations and trials of the Qur'an, and through them, build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves enveloped in darkness. Prophet Sulaiman salam, was himself a prophet and the son of a prophet, Prophet Dawood. Salam. He was given the gift of wisdom and deep understanding of the language of birds and animals. He was also given dominion over the wind and the jinn. The Quran mentions a story about Prophet Sulaiman's army of men, jinn, and birds, and says they came upon a valley of the ants, and an ant said, O oh, ants, Enter your dwellings so that you are not crushed by Sulaiman and his soldiers, while they perceive not. So Sulaiman smiled in amusement at her words and prayed, My Lord, inspire me to always be thankful for the favors which you have blessed me and my parents with, and to do good deeds that please you. Admit me by your mercy into the companion of your righteous servants. Allah commanded the Prophet Sulaiman to build the famous Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. He was a wise and just ruler, and his kingdom was so powerful that it is said that the throne of his kingdom was supported by the angels. He was a great king who used his wisdom and knowledge to judge disputes between people. He was also a great worshiper of Allah and is mentioned in the Qur'an as an example of a pious and devout servant of Allah.
The trials of wealth were a test to Prophet Sulaiman alayhi salam. The worldly wealth given to Prophet Sulaiman included vast amounts of gold, silver, gems, and other riches, as well as dominion over the wind and the jinn. He also had authority over the land and sea, and it was said that he even was able to control the weather. It was a test to see if he would be content with what Allah had given him, or if he would be tempted by worldly dominion and control. He was given immense wealth and power, but he remained content and devoted to Allah Azza wa Jal. وَمَنْ شَكَرَ فَإِنَّمَا يَشْكُرُ لِنَفْسِهِ وَمَنْ كَثَرَ فَإِنَّ رَبِّي غَنِيٌّ كَرِيمٌ And whoever is grateful, his gratitude is only for the benefit of himself. And whoever is ungrateful, then indeed my Lord is free of need and generous. Do you ever think of wealth being a test for you? How many people have been immensely blessed only to become increasingly stingy and greedy with their charity or sadaqah? In fact, we see that those who have less are usually the ones who are the most generous with the very little that they have. And we know that that is an elevated level of iman. We learn here that wealth in and of itself is not something to look down upon. Rather, it is when this love for wealth and its accumulation becomes a reason in distancing us from our Lord and His worship. While for some lies the test of financial difficulties, for others, the test is quite the opposite, and perhaps harder to detect when it's the test of wealth. So be grateful to your Lord by giving from what you have been given. Surely the only saving accounts that matters in our akhirah is our akhirah savings account. Everything that you spend will be lost except that which you spend for the sake of Allah. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will delve into stories of trials and tribulations in the Qur'an and through them build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with trials and tribulations. Prophet Yaqub salam is mentioned in the Qur'an numerous times. One of the most prominent verses is from Surah Yusuf. Indeed, he was a man of inner strength and outer resoluteness. Prophet Yaqub was tested by Allah in various ways. The test of Prophet Yaqub with his son Yusuf is one of the most significant tests mentioned in the Qur'an. Prophet Yaqub salam was tested when his beloved son Yusuf was taken away from him by his brothers, and sold into slavery. Despite this, Prophet Yaqub had faith that Allah would make a way for Yusuf and reunite him with his family. Islamic scholars believe that the time between losing Yusuf and finding him again was a period of 80 years. Imagine the pain of not just losing a child, but the uncertainty that came with such a test of not knowing whether this child was alive or their whereabouts. Prophet Yaqub is known for his beautiful patience in the face of hardship and adversity. This phrase is used to refer to his unwavering faith in Allah and his trust in Allah's plan. Despite the numerous tests that he's faced, Prophet Yaqub never lost hope and continued to be patient and hopeful in his faith. This is exemplified in the Qur'an in Surah Yusuf. وَتَوَلَّ عَنْهُمْ وَقَالَ يَا أَسَفَ عَلَى يُوسُفُ وَبِيَضَّتْ عَيْنَاهُ مِنَ الْحُزْنِ فَهُوَ كَظِيمٌ And he turned away from them and said, How great is my grief for Yusuf! And his eyes became white with sorrow, and he fell into a silent melancholy. Prophet Yaqub's patience and trust in Allah ultimately pays off, and he's reunited with Prophet Yusuf How many times have we heard of words shaming us for displaying sadness or prolonged periods of grief, as if grief 
was not at the core of many of the stories of our prophets alayhum salam. We learn from the story of Prophet Yaqub that sadness is not constricted to a certain amount of years. As a believer, feeling and expressing sadness does not make us any less of a Muslim. It is the sign of a beating heart. As Muslims, we know, though, that we do not glorify grief or succumb to it. Just like Prophet Yaqub, we channel this into an opportunity to turn to Allah for a greater and deeper connection, to ask for his guidance, for surely with beautiful patience comes a beautiful reward. The story of Prophet Yaqub ends with Yusuf's triumphant return to Egypt, where he is reunited with his family and becomes a powerful ruler in the court. After years of separation, Prophet Yusuf and his brothers are reconciled, and Prophet Yaqub's vision is restored by Allah's permission. Please continue to join us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will delve into stories of trials and tribulations in the Qur'an, and through them build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with navigating pain and prolonged grief. The story of the mother of Prophet Musa is one of the greatest testimonies to Indeed with Hardship Comes Eids. As Pharaoh brutally murdered all the sons born to Bani Israel, the mother of Sayyidina Musa feared for her son's life. Commanded by Allah, she set Sayyidina Musa into the Nile River, not knowing where or what will become of this basket with her newborn son in it. وَأَوْحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنِ رُضِعِيهِ فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمْ وَلَا تَخَافِي وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّا رَدُّوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُوهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ And we inspire to the mother of Musa, nurse him. But when you fear for him, cast him into the river. And do not fear and do not grieve. Indeed, we will return him to you, and we will make him one of the messengers. Imagine the pain of this mother's heart, placing your newborn son in a basket and setting him off into the waters. And the heart of Moses' mother ached so much that she almost gave away his identity, had we not reassured her heart in order for her to have faith in Allah's promise. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills for the baby to land in the palace of Fir'aun. SubhanAllah, this is the very place Prophet Musa's mother was trying to keep him away from. But Allah is surely the best of planners. There, Fir'aun's wife Sayyida Asiya takes in Prophet Musa and adopts him raising him as her own son. SubhanAllah once again, the very person Fir'aun feared the most was raised in his own palace. Allah's generosity extends to prevent Prophet Musa from accepting milk from any other woman until Prophet Musa's sister recommends Prophet Musa's very own mother to be the wet nurse. وَحَرَّمْنَا عَلَيْهِ الْمَرَاضِعَ مِنْ قَبْلِ فَقَالَتْ هَلْ أَدُلُّكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَيْتٍ يَكْفُلُونَهُ لَكُمْ وَهُمْ لَهُ نَاصِحُونَ And we had caused him to refuse all the wet nurses at first. So his sister suggested, Shall I direct you to a family who will bring him up for you and take good care of him? The heart of Prophet Musa's mother is soothed and put at ease as she's reunited with her baby, knowing that he is now safe from the brutal killings of Fir'aun. We too often face circumstances in our life that make us feel stranded with little or no control over the situations at hand. Through the story of Prophet Musa's mother, we're reminded that when we do not know the plan, we undoubtedly need to trust the planner, the greatest of all planners, Al-Mudabbir. 
He will mold our trials and resilience into beautiful outcomes. We are reminded that your Lord has not forsaken you. Trust in your Lord and trust in his way. Know that with hardship comes ease. They come together, not one after the other. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will delve into stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an, and through them, build a better understanding of how what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. Sayyida Asiya is mentioned in the Qur'an and was the wife of Fir'aun and is honored by being one of the greatest women of all times. Asiya was a very pious and devoted woman who believed in Allah despite living in the oppressive court of Fir'aun. She had all the wealth this world could offer. She was a queen and had lived her whole life in luxury and riches. When Prophet Musa's basket floated down the river and landed at her palace, she took in Prophet Musa and raised him as her own. Despite being aware of the dangers of her husband's rage, Sayyida Asiya declared her faith in Allah and supported Prophet Musa when he was sent down as a messenger to Fir'aun. Fir'aun was one of the most brutal humans to ever walk the face of this earth. And despite that, his wife, Sayyida Asiya, chose to stand up for her faith, even though it meant risking her life. Fir'aun was so enraged by her faith that he tortured her immensely. She was humiliated and tortured in public in an effort to make an example out of her. Amidst this grave torture, Sayyida Asiya called out to her Lord, رَبِّ بْنِ لِي عِنْدَكَ بَيْتًا فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنْ فِرْعَوْنَ وَعَمَلِهِ وَنَجِّنِي مِنَ الْقَوْمِ الظَّالِمِينَ My Lord, build for me a house in paradise near you, and deliver me from Pharaoh and his evil doing, and save me from the people who do wrong. Allah elevated her and allowed her to see her home in Jannah. Allah Azza wa Jal made an example out of her and honored her in the Qur'an, and for her story to be remembered for all time until the Day of Judgment. Not only did Sayyida Asiya raise Prophet Musa salam as her own son, but she also stood up against injustice and went against the greatest tyrant of all times. Amidst the torture, all she could see was her home in Jannah, and all she could feel was her nearness to Allah. Allah does not forget the pains of his servants, and every pain is rewarded with a much greater reward in the hereafter than what this world has to offer. But once the greatest test is remembering our Lord in the most trying of times, it is important that we constantly train our hearts with the dhikr of Allah so that when trials of pain reach us, our hearts are in a state of remembrance already. May we all be like Sayyida Asiya, strong, resilient, and grounded in the face of oppression and injustice. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will delve into stories of trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an, and through them, build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. When we think of the origins of the well of Zamzam, a well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us will never dry out, we remember the trials and tribulations of our mother Hajar. Sayyida Hajar was the wife of Prophet Ibrahim, and together they had traveled to Mecca to make their way out of the palace of the Pharaoh of Egypt, who was brutal and unjust to the woman of his nation. 
Sayyida Hajar was also expecting the arrival of their child, Ismail alayhi salam. And Mecca was a barren land at the time of Prophet Ibrahim and Sayyida Hajar's arrival. There was no water, no vegetation, and no established nations there. At that moment, Prophet Ibrahim received a command by Allah to leave Sayyida Hajar, who was expecting their baby any minute, and to leave Mecca. Sayyidah Hajar was confused and did not understand, but had no doubt that Prophet Ibrahim's actions were from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And she asked him, did Allah command you with this? And the Prophet Ibrahim confirmed, and Sayyidah Hajar knew that Allah would not forsake her. So she said, then Allah will not cause us to be lost. Just like Sayyidah Maryam, Sayyidah Hajar endured the pain of labor and delivery alone, with no help and no company. At the cry of her baby, Prophet Ismail, Allah willed that the well of Zamzam would spring from under the feet of baby Ismail. Sayyidah Hajar's faith and undoubted conviction in Allah lives with us until this very day. The journey we make during Hajj and Umrah between the mountains of Safa and Marwa is a testament to the difficulties of our mother, Sayyidah Hajar. The trials of this world like single parenthood and the journeys we find ourselves having to take on alone can be heavy on us, but they also weigh heavy in our scale of deeds. If Allah helps you, none can overcome you. And if he forsakes you, who is there after that that can help you? In Allah, then let the believers put their trust. We must remember to ask for Allah's help and that every test that we encounter, that we pass, is with Allah's guidance. One of my favorite sayings is that what was for you will never pass you by. And what passes you by was never meant for you. Please continue to join us and support us from Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will be delving into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Quran, and through them, build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. When Surah Yusuf came down to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, it was a source of light to the many trials and tribulations that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was going through. From persecution by his own family members to the death of his loved ones and a harsh economic boycott that left many Muslims with irrevocable physical deteriorations. In the story of Prophet Yusuf, we see a recurring element and that is Prophet Yusuf's shirt. We see that Prophet Yusuf's shirt mentioned over and over again in three instances in the Qur'an. The first time we encounter the mention of Prophet Yusuf's shirt is when his brothers, overpowered by jealousy, cast him into a well. And in an effort to escape any blame from their father, Prophet Yaqub, they covered Prophet Yusuf's shirt with their own blood in an effort to convince their father that he was captured by a wolf. Prophet Yusuf is eventually rescued from the well by a passing caravan and is sold to a wealthy Egyptian minister who stresses to his wife to look after him as they might adopt him as a son. The Egyptian who had bought him told his wife, look after him and honor him with respect. It's possible that he may be of use to us or we might adopt him as a son. As Prophet Yusuf السلام, approaches manhood, Zulaikha, the wife of Al-Aziz, the wealthy minister of Egypt, becomes more fond of him and attempts to seduce him. This brings us to the second time we encounter the mention of Prophet Yusuf's shirt. Prophet Yusuf refuses her advances 
and only then, Allah's help came to him, displaying a clear sign that prevented him from accepting her advances. Prophet Yusuf faces the trials of false accusations, and this is when the shirt comes into the scene again. A member of Al-Aziz's household makes the famous recommendation, وَشَهِدَ شَاهِدٌ مِّنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ كَانَ قَمِيسُهُ قَدْ قُدَّ مِنْ قُبُلٍ فَصَدَقَتْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الْكَاذِبِينَ وَإِنْ كَانَ قَمِيسُهُ قَدْ قُدَّ مِنْ دُبُرٍ فَكَذَبَتْ وَهُوَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ And if the shirt is torn in front, she speaks the truth. And he has clearly told a shameless lie. But if his shirt is torn at the back, then she has lied. And he has clearly told the simple truth. And with that, Prophet Yusuf's innocence is proven by the terror on the back of his shirt. The last incident where we see the mention of Prophet Yusuf's shirt is towards the end of the story when Prophet Yusuf alayhi salam becomes the ruler and how has the upper hand. When his brothers ask for forgiveness, they're given Prophet Yusuf's shirt to take back to their grieving father, Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam, to cover his face with it and to help return his vision with Allah's permission. One shirt, three layers of complex trials, tribulations, and triumphed resilience. With that, Prophet Yusuf rises from the depth of the dark well to become the ruler of the land. Sometimes, in the face of injustice, our nafs, our lower base self, might convince us that injustice has had the upper hand and is prevailing, or that they got away with it. But surely there is wisdom in Allah's plan. Through it all, Prophet Yusuf demonstrates unwavering faith in Allah and never questions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will. He shows patience, perseverance, despite the immense suffering he endured. And once again, we see the repeated sentiment of never give up hope. Resilience in the face of persecution and resilience in the face of temptation, because through all of it, Prophet Yusuf had absolute yaqeen or certainty that with beautiful patience comes relief. فَصَبْرٌ جَمِيلٌ Wallahu al Please continue to join us for Maristan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will delve into the stories of trials and tribulations in the Quran, and through them, build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with trials and tribulations. Betrayal. Betrayal is a difficult test, but even more painful when that betrayal comes at the hands of the closest people to you, your friends and family, those who you've entrusted. The story of Prophet Yusuf السلام, in the Quran serves as a source of guidance to trials that involve pain that comes from betrayal, slander, and persecution. Prophet Yusuf السلام, is cast into the well by his very own brothers who were given the responsibility of caring for and protecting him. For many of us, this is a difficult pain to recover from, the pain of being hurt by those whom we've been entrusted to. Betrayal can also lead to feelings of hurt, anger, confusion, and even depression. It can be difficult to rebuild trust after a betrayal and can take a long time to forgive and to move on. In the story of Prophet Yusuf, the longest part of the story, one may think that his brothers had gotten away with their wrongdoings. But as Allah wills, the outcome proves to be in the favor of Prophet Yusuf This favor was shown to the Prophet Yusuf when he was honored to become a ruler of the lands, and at which point his brothers asked for his forgiveness and repented to Allah. Prophet Yusuf dealt with betrayal in a very patient and forgiving manner, having full trust in Allah's plan. He also knew that harboring resentment against those who wronged him would not help him in the long run. 
When we choose to forgive, we forgive for our own mental and emotional well-being. Forgiveness in the light of betrayal is sometimes a difficult thing to come to terms with. But when we understand that Allah will always work things out in our favor, then harboring ill feelings becomes easier to dismiss. But this, of course, is after taking the necessary measures to protect ourselves from any harm this portrayal might pose. All in all, through Prophet Yusuf's story, we are more and more assured that Allah is in control of all affairs, and that Allah knows what we don't know, and that we are limited in what we can comprehend. وَلِنُعَلِّمَهُ مِنْ تَأْوِيلِ الْأَحَادِيثِ وَاللَّهُ غَالِبٌ عَلَىٰ أَمْرِهِ وَلَكِنْ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ And thus we established Yusuf in the land to teach him the true meanings of events. Allah was in control of his affairs. However, most of mankind do not know. The only control we have is how we choose to respond to our trials and tribulations, knowing that Allah will never forsake us, He will never lead us astray, and He will always lay the pieces of the puzzle in a way that is more befitting than we could have possibly imagined. The glue to those pieces is our faith, and our iman as we increase our faith in Allah's way and strengthen our du'as. We strengthen that glue and stand ground when the winds of tribulations hit. We also should do what Prophet Yusuf did and reach out for help when we need it. Prophet Yusuf told his cellmate to help him. And he said to the one he knew would survive, Mention me in the presence of your master. This is so important. Because often, we think that we can do it all by ourselves and with strong faith. But at times, we need to reach out for help. And eventually, his cellmate remembers Prophet Yusuf's words and tells the ruler about his ability to interpret dreams. And eventually, this is what leads Prophet Yusuf from his release from prison. Prayer, strong iman, belief in God's plan, and taking our own action this is the recipe for success. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we will delve into stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an and through them build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. One of the most famous stories of repentance in the Qur'an is that of our father, Prophet Adam salam. It was a clear insight into the temptations this world has to offer and the whisperings of shaitan. فَوَسْوَسَ إِلَيْهِ الشَّيْطَانُ قَالَ يَا آدَمُ هَلْ أَدُلَّكَ عَلَى شَجَرَةِ الْخُلْدِ وَمُلْكٍ لَا يَبْلَى Then Satan whispered to him and said, O oh Adam, shall I direct you to the tree of eternity? And possession that does not deteriorate. Shaitan called Prophet Adam by name and whispered to him, promising him wealth, power, and eternity. Prophet Adam salam, was tempted by the picture Shaitan painted for him despite having lived in eternal paradise and despite Allah clearly warning Adam of the intentions of Shaitan. فَوَسْوَسَ لَهُمَا الشَّيْطَانُ لِيُبْدِيَ لَهُمَا مَا وُرِيَ عَنْهُمَا مِنْ سَوْآتِهِمَا وَقَالَ مَا نَهَاكُمَا رَبُّكُمْ عَنْ هَذِهِ شَجَرَةِ أَلَا أَنْ تَكُونَ مَلَكَيْنِ أَوْ تَكُونَ مِنَ الْخَالِدِينَ But Satan made an evil suggestion to both of them that he might reveal to them their shame that had remained hidden from them. And he said, Your Lord has forbidden you to approach this tree only to prevent you from becoming angels or immortals. This incident will come to define our natural human instincts to be pulled into temptations of this dunya from wealth, power, and disillusion that this life is forever. 
Prophet Ibrahim السلام, was aware that his creation was different from that of angels and desired life and status, though it be a higher status than human beings. Both Adam and Eve were deceived, together, by the whispers of Iblis and expelled from this eternal paradise. At this, Prophet Adam السلام, and Eve came to the reality of their wrongdoings and quickly repented back to Allah asking for forgiveness. قَالَ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِنْ لَمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمَنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Both cried out to their Lord, O Lord, we have wronged ourselves. If you do not forgive us and do not have mercy on us, we shall surely be amongst the losers. Allah accepted their repentance and forgave them. فَتَلَقَّى آدَمُ مِنْ رَبِّهِ كَلِمَاتٌ فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ Then Adam received from his Lord some words and he accepted his repentance. Indeed, it is he who is accepting of repentance, the merciful. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it clear to us that there is always a door of repentance left open for the believer. All you have to do is ask Allah for it. All we have to do is realize that it is how we choose to respond to committing the sin that is the issue. We are human and only human. Your humanity is not defined by your sins, but by turning back to Allah. And that is an honor that Allah has bestowed upon humanity. So when this dunya tempts you, and when that temptation becomes your test and your trial, no that there is always a door and a pathway into immediate forgiveness. Do not lose sight of the Lord's infinite mercy. Not only will Iblis whisper us into temptation, but he will also sometimes follow that whispering with thoughts of hopelessness and helplessness, as if we have sinned too much to be worthy of forgiveness. In our deen, we are taught that feeling unworthy is a trick of shaitan, and that we should combat it. At times, you can do this on your own, and at times you might turn to family and friends, and at times a spiritual teacher will be most useful, and at times a spiritually integrated approach to counseling is needed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that there are no limits to his forgiveness, even if our sins were to top mountains. With forgiveness comes open doors of Jannah prepared for those who fear Allah and turn back to him on their human shortcomings. وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِّن رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرُضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ أُعِدَّتْ لِلْمُتَّقِينَ And march forward in the way which leads to forgiveness from your Lord. For paradise is wide as the heavens and the earth, and it is prepared for the muttaqoon. Thank you for joining and supporting Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we delved into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an, and through them we learned how to build our resilience wherever we find ourselves faced with trials and tribulations of our own. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from us and from you, Fortify us and you, and make us from those who are happy in both abodes, this world and the next. I want you to imagine the scene I'm going to describe to you. It is the 10th year of prophethood and Quraysh has continued with their persecution of placing a boycott on the Muslims. Not only are the Muslims cut off from the rest of Mecca, but they are given the ultimatum of handing in the Prophet ﷺ, or suffering the consequences of starving to death. The years of the boycott took a toll on the Muslims. Many went days without food, and the only food that they could get was snuck into them without the knowledge of Quraysh. And then, the Prophet wasallam experiences the loss of the two closest people to him. First, 
the loss of his external protector, his uncle Abu Talib. Not only does Abu Talib pass away as a result of the compounded effects of this boycott, but he passes away without taking the shahada. And the Prophet ﷺ is devastated by this. The Prophet ﷺ said that he would continue to ask for forgiveness for his uncle until Allah forbade him from doing so. Allah revealed, إِنَّكَ لَا تَهْدِي مَنْ أَحْبَبْتِ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ يَهْدِي مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَهُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِالْمُهْدَدِينَ Indeed, O Muhammad, you do not guide whom you like, but Allah guides whom He wills, and He is the most knowing of the rightly guided. Our brothers and sisters who have lost family members in a similar manner know that this is painful, and the grief is multiplied tenfold. And then comes the death of his internal protector, Sayyidah Khadija radiallahu anha, his beloved wife, companion, and the mother of his children. The first person to believe in him, even before he believed in himself. It's as though she had already known that he was going to be something very special. And when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ran to her, trembling, coming down from the cave of Hira, and receiving the revelation, she assured him, Kalla abshir. By Allah, Allah will never disgrace you. Sayyidah Khadija was supportive and comforting to the Prophet ﷺ. She offered this support emotionally, physically, and financially, helping finance the early days of Islam and spreading the message. In life, we have internal and external protectors, people who we go to for comfort, those who we go to in times of trouble and tribulation. The Prophet ﷺ lost those figures in his life in the span of less than one month and during one of the most difficult and troubling times for the Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ's sadness prolonged so much that the companions began to worry about him. He dealt with his sadness by turning to Allah in prayer and remembrance. He also found comfort in the companionship of close family members and friends. And he continued to perform his duties and responsibilities with patience and resilience. He used to constantly remember Sayyida Khadija and speak of her in a positive manner. If our own Prophet wasallam, experienced this immense sadness and grief for a prolonged period of time, then who are we? to deny ourselves and others this part of our humanity. We often find ourselves hastening the grief of those around us, or not allowing ourselves to take the time to grieve our losses. What does matter is how we choose to act upon this sadness. For the believer, every bump, every setback, and every pain is an opportunity for dua, for nearness to Allah, for elevation of our Iman. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we are delving into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an, and through them, working to build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. When the Prophet ﷺ mentions Ta'if, he mentions it as the most brutal or worst day of his life. وَكَانَ أَشَدُّ مَا لَقَيْتُ مِنْهُمْ يَوْمَ الْعَقَبَةِ Meaning Ta'if. The Prophet ﷺ had stepped outside the scope of Mecca in search of support from neighboring tribes. And not only was he turned away, but for the duration of three miles outside of Ta'if, the Prophet ﷺ was targeted by the people of Ta'if, who gathered to throw stones and rocks at our beloved Prophet. Outside of Mecca, he was met with the angel Jibreel, who said to him, Allah has sent the angel of the mountains to you, so that you may order him to do whatever you wish to these people. And the angel of the mountains greeted him and said, O Muhammad, 
order what you wish, and if you like, I will let the mountains fall on them. And the Prophet ﷺ said, No. Rather, I hope that Allah will bring from their descendants people who will worship Allah alone without associating partners with Him. SubhanAllah. If you were to go to visit Ta'if today, you would find its people to be some of the most faithful and devout Muslims in action and speech. The Prophet's dua was answered, and from the descendants of the very same people who threw him out with stones and caused him to bleed profusely, came generations of Muslims who continue to spread the message of Islam and call upon Allah. Amidst the series of trials that the Prophet ﷺ was given, is one of the most greatest and personal miracles and the gift of the Isra and the Ma'raj. Subhan alladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami'u al-basir. The Prophet ﷺ is led on a blessed journey to Jerusalem where he leads the prayer at Masjid al-Aqsa with every prophet and messenger ever sent down praying behind him. He then is ascended through the skies and heavens to meet the prophets and the greatest meeting of all, the meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At every stop and every meeting, the Prophet ﷺ it was as though Allah was showing him and giving him comfort over and over again. That indeed Allah is with you, and this too shall pass. The Prophet ﷺ was shown the signs of his power and greatness. When you meet your ta'if, know that ascension might be right around the corner, and Allah will not forsake you. Indeed and surely with hardship comes ease, not after with, together, hand in hand. This ease may not be the return of a lost loved one or the absolute resolution of a hardship. Rather, it may be the calmness and peacefulness Allah instills inside of you that allows you to deal with these trials in a way that is pleasing to Him and beneficial to you. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we are delving into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an, and through them, building a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. One of the highest honors given to Sayyida Maryam was the mentioning of her name in the Qur'an. She is the only woman to have an entire chapter of the Qur'an named after her. The Qur'an speaks highly of Sayyida Maryam, referring to her as the best of all women. The Qur'an also states that she was chosen by Allah. O oh Mary, behold, Allah has chosen you and made you pure and exalted you above all the women of the world. Sayyidah Maryam's faith was truly unshakable. Her faith in Allah inspired her uncle, Prophet Zakaria, to make dua for a child despite all the biological reasons that would make it impossible for Sayyidah Zakaria to have a child of his own. Whenever Zakaria would enter upon Sayyidah Maryam's room, he would find her worshipping, and he would find the finest fruits and provisions in her room. There were fruits that were out of season, which confirmed to Prophet Zakaria that this was a miracle from Allah that Sayyidah Maryam was blessed with. It's a testament of her devotion to Allah. We know that Sayyidah Maryam was a woman who had perfected her faith, and this proved necessary to enable her to withstand the test she was about to be given. When the archangel Jibril brought tidings of a child, Sayyidah Maryam was shocked, as this was something that we know as humans to be biologically impossible. How 
How can I have a son when no man has ever touched me, nor am I unchaste? But the archangel Gabriel quickly reminds Sayyidah Maryam, قَالَ كَذَلِكِ قَالَ رَبُّكِ هُوَ عَلَيَّ هَيًّا وَلِنَجْعَلَهُ آيَةً لِلنَّاسِ وَرَحْمَةً مِنَّا وَكَانَ أَمْرًا مَقْضِيًّا So will it be, your Lord says, it is easy for me. And so we will make him a sign for humanity and a mercy from us, and it is a matter already decreed. And so Sayyidah Maryam came to find herself carrying a child that she must now birth alone with no help, no support, and an added layer of slander as the people of her town accuse her and question her actions. She took to the desert to birth her child, and as the pains of labor came in, she called out to Allah, Alas, I wish I had died before this, and I was a thing forgotten. It is important to point out here that her wish was not a rejection of Allah's decree, but a cry for help. And there, Allah's mercy came as a stream appeared under her feet, so she may drink from it. She then birthed her child, Prophet Isa, Jesus, and was commanded to shake a palm tree, from which nutritious, wholesome dates fell for her to nourish herself and be able to feed her new newborn. Until this day, expecting and new moms are recommended to eat dates because of the benefit they carry. The birth of Prophet Isa or Jesus and the shaking of the palm tree are lessons on tawakkul, reliance on God. It would have been easy for Allah to have the dates just fall in Sayyidah Maryam's lap, just like he sent her out of season fruits earlier. But in this is a lesson for all of us, that Allah will guide us, but we have to put in the effort first. This palm tree was not something that's easily shaken. If you've ever tried to shake a palm tree, you'll know that it's a very difficult matter. But Allah's will triumphs in our knowledge and understanding of the dunya and how it works. فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنًا So eat and drink and put your heart at ease. If you put in the effort, Allah the facilitator, Al-Mudabbir, will facilitate matters for you. He will put your heart at ease and will envelop your heart into a cushion of comfort and tranquility to match your resilience and trust in His ways. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series where we delve into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an and through them build a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with our own trials and tribulations. Our mother Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha endured the trial that targeted her reputation despite her well-known character. Being the daughter of the most honorable companion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the wife of the most honorable of all of mankind, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. Slandering is painful because it causes significant damage to a person's reputation. It can hurt the person's relationships career prospects, and emotional well-being. It can also be difficult to repair the damage that has been done to a person's reputation. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet, was slandered because of false accusations about her character and conduct during one of the caravan traveling trips. These accusations were spread by some of the Prophet's enemies who sought to discredit the Prophet himself and his teachings. The incident began when Sayyidah Aisha radiallahu anha was returning from a journey with a companion, Safwan, who had stayed behind while she had gone forward. Upon her return, rumors spread 
and at first Sitana Aisha was ill and did not hear of these rumors, but as she came to learn of them, she was quite saddened. The trial of Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha was undoubtedly a difficult and lonely experience for her. She was quickly shamed and humiliated by the accusations made against her and the intense scrutiny of her character and conduct. This was undoubtedly an emotional, draining experience for Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha, who was deeply devoted to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. During this process, Sayyida Aisha never once begged her family or the Messenger of Allah to believe her. She had unwavering faith in Allah that Allah himself would prove her innocence. Allah revealed shortly after, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ جَاءُوا بِالْإِفْقِ عُصْبَةٌ مِّنْكُمْ لَا تَحْسَبُهُ شَرٌ لَكُمْ بَلْ هُوَ خَيْرٌ لَكُمْ لِكُلِّ امْرِئٍ مِّنْهُمْ مَكْتَسَبَ مِنَ الْإِثْمِ وَالَّذِي تَوَلَّى كِبْرُهُ مِنْهُمْ لَهُ عَذَابٌ عَظِيمٌ Indeed, those who came up without outrageous slander are a group of you. Do not think this is bad for you. Rather, it is good for you. They will be punished each according to the share of their sin. Sayyida Aisha was eventually vindicated when the accusations against her were proven false. Despite her innocence being proven, this incident left a lasting impression on her that would have undoubtedly caused her tremendous distress. Sometimes, when we don't give ourselves permission to acknowledge the distress, we might brush it under the rug, or might even feel guilty about feeling down about something that happened to us. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the tools we need to face worldly injustices and stand our ground even when it seems like the entire world is against us. At times, this may look like turning to Allah to offload our troubles and ask for wisdom in dealing with our tribulations. And at other times, this might mean seeking out support from individuals who are trained to help us process that distress and see wisdom behind the tribulations. Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha is an inspiring example of resilience, faith, and loyalty. Despite the difficulty and trying circumstances she faced, Sayyida Aisha radiallahu anha maintained her faith in Allah and trusted the process. This incident teaches us that we should always remain true to our convictions and trust in Allah's justice, even when facing difficult times. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series. We are where we are delving into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an. And through them, we're building a better understanding of how we can do better when we face our own trials and tribulations. Prophet Ibrahim saw his dua manifest into reality when he met the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam on the night of the journey of the Isra in Maraj. And he saw the result of his dua to be generations of Muslims who call upon their Lord. The power of dua is something we often forget to do or do not stress quite enough. It's oftentimes left until the end when we've exhausted what our hands and minds can do. But Allah tells us that the gift of dua that he's given us is an uninterrupted line of connection between us and our creator, the king, the planner of all of our affairs. We see over and over again in the Qur'an that the prophets using dua first and foremost to settle their affairs and deal with the tribulations that they have very little control over. The dua of Prophet Ibrahim after he left his wife Sayyidah Hajar and their unborn child, Prophet Ismail, in the desert, is a display of devotion, but also immense tawakkul. In that moment, we know that there was not an easy task for Prophet Ibrahim. After many years of asking for a child, he must now walk away from the child and leave behind his family in an empty, barren land to answer the command of Allah. 
Prophet Ibrahim makes the dua, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyati biwadin ghayra di zara' Inda baytika al-muharram Rabbana liyuqimu al-salah Baj'al af'idatan min al-nasi tahwi ilayhim Warzuqhum min al-thamarati la'allahum yashkurun Our Lord, I have settled some of my offspring in a barren valley near your sacred house. Our Lord, so they may establish prayer. So make the hearts of the believing people incline towards them and provide them with fruits, so perhaps they will be thankful. And so Allah takes care of Sayyida Hajar, eases her delivery, and blesses Prophet Ibrahim's progeny. And from his progeny comes the best of all of mankind, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Utilize the resources Allah has given you. The potency of dua is hard to fully grasp, but those who have unlocked this door have allowed for a door of mercy and gentleness to envelop their trials and equip them with a resilience beyond measure. Please continue to join us and support us for Madistan's Embracing Resilience series, where we are delving into the stories of the trials and tribulations mentioned in the Qur'an, and through them, building a better understanding of what we can do when we find ourselves faced with trials and tribulations of our own.